no, thank you again for coming to the why, the what, and the how of attendance works in our elementary school. And with our panel here today with Sarah, um, Shan, Sanch, Sanch, Shantz. See, we're a first name basis only. <laughs> <laughs> but Sarah is with um, the North Gadwin Elementary School. She's with KSSN Network. She's been with them for three years, and she'll be bringing forth her expertise with a very high at-risk school district that she's working in. We also then have Elizabeth, correct? Elizabeth is an outstated DHS um, employee um, and part of the KSSN network. She has been with DSH for 10 years. Did I, I'm dyslexic, so it does come out <laughs> backwards, and that is not a lie. I actually am, so that doesn't come out as a lie. And then for the last six years, you have been DHS services and a barrier removal for at-risk kids, correct? Wonderful. And then we have Sir Joe. Sergio, thank you. Um, Sergio has been with the KSS coordinator for Kent Social or Kent School Services with Sibley, correct? Yes. Wonderful. And you have been working for eight years, working with youth involved with the juvenile systems prior to that with West uh, Wedgwood Christian. And now, how long have you been with KSSN total? Three years. Three years. I mean, we got a lot of expertise here. And then we have our last um, speaker, which is Abby Van Hoven. Wonderful. Um, she is also a DHS case manager, working with the Kent School Services Network. You've been with them for 10 years. 10 years, and how long? Wow. So between all of you, you have something like 40 years. <laughs> so welcome, and I thank you again for your expertise and working with us, and we look forward to uh, hearing all about the exciting news. You might want to wait a second and wait a couple minutes. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Take a seat. Please or take a cup for the here. Social experiment. Yeah, we're going to say. Thanks for coming. I think we've got everybody here that's coming to the session, and I would like to personally Abby welcome you. This isn't really transmitting, but it's for the, the, the recorder. So, um, welcome very, um, thank you very much for coming to the what, why, and how of attendance works in elementary school setting. My name is Abby Van Hoven. I'm a DHS worker at Sibley. This is my coworker, Sibley, or Sibley, Sergio Sierra Reyes, and he also works at Sibley Elementary School as the um, community school coordinator. My coworker, Elizabeth Davis from Department of Human Services, is stationed at Godwin. Um, North Godwin Elementary, along with her co-worker, Sarah Schantz, who is the Community School Coordinator at Godwin Elementary, North Godwin Elementary. So at this time, we'd just like to welcome you. We're really excited to be one of the speakers here at the Literacy Summit, and we're going to start with a short video. Um, thank you very much. Chronic absenteeism in kindergarten is associated with lower academic performance in first grade regardless of gender, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status. Going to school regularly in the early years is especially critical for children from families living in poverty who are less likely to have the resources to help children make up for lost time in the classroom. Among children living in poverty, chronic absence in kindergarten predicts the lowest levels of academic achievement at the end of fifth grade. And I thank the Lord for our just school because of the social worker and the uh, support system that they put up in Alger. But it's much different having Elizabeth at the school, um, having her there. She knows my son. She knows me. I can go into the office and just talk about things. I can call her anytime and say, I need help and not have to feel bad or um, like a burden. Three years ago, the community decided to try something differently. 
we decided that uh, we needed to bring more resources to s children and families, but right in the neighborhood, at the school level, so that we could support them close to home and uh, in a way that was um, more effective. Um, we created the Kent School Services Network, a network of community service providers to really support student achievement. The services are coordinated by a community school coordinator who works with a team of professionals right here at the school and brings disparate resources right here, right into one place for families. So resources like nursing from Spectrum Health, mental health services from Network 180, um, Cherry Street Dental Services, and um, phys workers from the Department of Human Services are all brought here into the school for one um, resource. And not only that, but then we bring out more resources because we have churches, neighborhood associations, volunteers, mentors coming in, and services are coordinated. It's not a scattered approach. It's all system systemically done together to support students. KSSN helps us create the conditions for learning by bridging those gaps is that we reach a crucial tipping point where so many things are happening that are proactive, that are positive, geared towards youth development that you start to see an influence in kids' lives and what they're able to do academically because those barriers have just simply been removed from their lives. Everybody in the building has really taken to her role and really understands why she's in the building. So if there's a concern, everybody knows exactly where they go. We look circumspectively at students' needs and say, well, what is the problem? We look, we'll look at academically, uh, socially, physically. And if there are any problems or any, anything that's hindering their education, we come together as a team to find solutions. My job is to coordinate resources for students and families here at Algin Middle School. Part of my job is to make sure that students' needs are met, um, that barriers to learning are removed. We want to make sure that every student is healthy and that they are able to attend school on a daily basis. We take a holistic approach to learning and also to addressing the needs of students here at Algin Middle School with Kent School Services Network support. Parents are important to us as well too. We work very closely to, with parents to make sure that their family needs are taken care of, again to ensure that students are here each day and ready to learn. And I thank the Lord for Algin School because of the social worker and the uh, support system that they put up in Alger. I had an uh, emergency for us, my gas. And I called Lorraine, and Lorraine kind of noticed in my voice that I was kind of hyper and upset, and she just told me to calm down. We can fix this. And she gave me steps on doing what I needed to do. At that particular time, I, had several things going. I got six grandkids in the house in the summertime and I had some things I needed to do for them for summer school and if it had not been for the social work at that time I don't know what my mind would have been like that day. Uh, when my son Xavier was very little, probably a year old, uh, we worked through DHS at the main building and it was very difficult to make contact, to get return calls. The caseworker was overloaded, but it's much different having Elizabeth at the school. Um, having her there, she knows my son, she knows me. I can go into the office and just talk about things. I can call her anytime and say, I need help, and not have to feel bad or um, like a burden, just, you know, like I'm reaching out to a friend, somebody who cares about me, and um, that's what I get at Sibley is the support and the compassion that I need to be a good mom, and it's made all the difference. Change is never easy, and changing how families interact with the demands of school and the education system takes effort for parents, 
for schools, and for students. But we are seeing signs of progress in the Kent School Services Network schools, working along with traditional academic, after school, and extracurricular programs, KSSN plays an important role in the progress being achieved at the schools. At Alger Middle School, MEEP scores in math are up and all 8th grade MEEP scores have improved. Burton Elementary 4th grade math scores are up. At Coit Creative Arts Academy, all grades in MEEP math scores are up and 4th grade reading and language arts scores are up and absenteeism is way, way down. At Harrison Park Elementary, 4th grade math scores have improved since it became a KSSN pilot school. At Martin Luther King Jr. Leadership Academy, third grade meet math scores and English language arts scores have improved over three years. At Pine Island Elementary, third grade meet scores in English and language arts are improved. And Sibley Elementary saw a great improvement in its absenteeism. Um, my name is Elizabeth and I am the DHS worker now at North Godwin. Um, I have been doing this for eight years. Um, my first five years I was at Sibley and Allison was my client. And I got to know Allison is because I called um, her house because her son was chronically late or um, not at school at all. And I found out Allison was a victim of domestic violence and she was looking to leave her husband. She came into my office, we developed a plan I was able through DHS to help her purchase a car, car insurance, tags, things that she needed for her and her family to um, move and, and start their life away from her husband. We were able to set up counseling services right at the school for her son. Xavion didn't miss any more school. He was there, he was in class every day ready to learn because his needs were being met. At the time, they only had Medicaid for the family. But when she left, obviously her income is less, so she had to apply for welfare programs. She could do that all right with me um, and didn't have to feel um, diminished. She didn't have to feel like she, um, she didn't know what to do. I mean, she had been living with this for years and she finally felt like she had the steps and the, and the tools um, to be able to leave. And that's what the community school model is, is we're bringing all of these resources um, into the school of inner city families. And these are situations that schools across our nation face every single day. But maybe they don't have the resources or the time. Teachers may see and that there's something going on with a student, he's falling asleep in class, or um, you know, there's different things that could go on in a school classroom that a teacher can't necessarily address. So the goal of DHS is to, um, one of the things that I do is I determine eligibility for um, the families of the students that are enrolled at uh, the school. Um, I also monitor attendance on a weekly basis. I make sure kids are there. If they're not, then I'm calling home. I'm meeting with families. I'm doing, completing an assessment to identify any barriers that they might have. Could be transportation. It could be, you know, winter coats. It could be shoes. It could be counseling needs or um, um, getting a doctor, finding a doctor in their area. Um, a lot of times the teachers are that don't have a community school model, they're trying to do these things for their parents. The parents are coming and telling them that, you know, hey, my lights are off, and they're trying to figure out how to do that. Our goal is to take that job from the teachers so they're in the classroom teaching. The students are in the classroom ready to learn every day. Um, our idea is um, in a community school is to be proactive. We want to know of these um, things that are going on in their lives before they happen. You know, a car is getting ready to break down. We want to repair it before they lose their job, before they lose their house, and then ultimately have to move and the child has to start school. By getting that student in that class, in a same classroom every day, we're promoting literacy. You know, their scores are better, they're able to concentrate and learn in a better environment. Thank you, at this time I'm just gonna hand out um, cups to those of you that don't have one yet and what I want you to do is to hold this cup in your hand if you would please and imagine with me that this is not just a cup but this is a student and this student is in your school in your community in our community because we're talking about the Kent um, and Ottawa areas here today um, this student's name is Jacqueline. She's eight years old, and she has a 15-year-old sister and two younger brothers. I want to talk about some of the things going on in Jacqueline's life. And as, I, as I'm telling you about Jacqueline, I'd like you to take a utensil, pencil, 
or um, pen if you have one. And anytime you hear me talk about something that you think would be something placing Jacqueline either at risk for um, not coming to school, um, at risk for uh, not being able to learn in the classroom, I want you to go ahead and just make a hole anywhere in your cup to represent that risk or that barrier in Jacqueline's life. Um, as I said, Jacqueline is an eight-year-old student at a school in um, your community, and um, Jacqueline's mom works a, um, <laughs> sorry, Jacqueline's mom actually is a single mom, and her dad goes to um, see Jacqueline infrequently, and, and recently he's actually been incarcerated for non-payment of child support. Um, Jacqueline's at home a lot with her older sister, helping care for her younger siblings while mom is at work. She doesn't get to see her. She works a second shift job, um, and sometimes she has to work overtime. So in the evenings, Jacqueline and her older sister are left to care for the younger siblings who are three in one. On this particular morning, Jacqueline oversleeps. <clears throat> she feels like mom must have forgot to set the alarm, or maybe she got home late, worked overtime. She must have been tired. Mom's still sleeping, and she's late to school. She just hates walking alone to school. None of the other kids are, are walking at that time, and she feels scared. Um, she also doesn't like walking into the class late because everybody looks at her like, you're late again. She scoops some clothes off the floor and wishes they were clean, but mom didn't get, doesn't get paid until Friday, and so she's pretty sure they'll have time to go to the laundromat this week, but at least she's hopeful that they'll have a ride to get there. Arriving to school, she takes her seat and starts listening to the teacher give the science lesson instructions. She drifts off in thoughts of hunger. Her stomach is growling. Oh, she didn't have time to eat breakfast this morning. The morning passes, and lunch finally arrives, and then out for recess, Jacqueline decides to sit on a bench and watch a game of tag because her shoes that she's wearing are too small and they hurt her toes when she runs. She's wearing her older sister's shoes because they couldn't afford shoes this year. She thinks to herself, these shoes, my sister must have had much smaller feet when she was eight years old because these just don't fit. Back in class, it's time for independent reading. She loves the books she has been reading but must have dozed off because the next thing she knows, her teacher is tapping her on the shoulder to wake up. It's hard staying up late, but she just wants to see her mom before she goes to bed and get a good night kiss. The bell rings hours later, and she grabs her sack supper and heads home. Her sister is outdoors with the little ones watching them play. Mom is already off to work. The light guy comes and cuts our lights out. He says my mom didn't pay. Now how will we make dinner? Her sister goes to the fridge and gets some milk, grabs some cereal, and says, this is dinner tonight. I offer my sack supper to split up as well. We sit on the porch to complete some homework and then play outside until it's due too dark to play. Nothing else to do and no TV. She goes to bed with so much on her mind, hoping tomorrow will be a better day. And the reason I tell this story is, is just to give uh, an example of, if this is really Jacqueline in your hand and these are really the things that she's facing, how can we expect her to hold, retain the knowledge that she's expected to retain when she walks into the classroom every day? May it be late or whatnot. She still is, has all this information that we're trying to get to her. Um, and before I was outstationed at Sibley Elementary School, I was that, that DHS worker that Allison talks about that was back at the main building. And as much as I had it in my heart to help people, I wasn't in the right place. So now that you know I'm placed out, I don't just know about the check stubs that Jacqueline's mom is handing me so that I can budget her food stamps. I don't just get the emergency application for the, the lights being cut out. I actually know who Jacqueline is, and I know what Jacqueline's facing when she comes to school because I have a relationship with her mom. I know where they live. I know what their needs are. I've been to their home. I'm one of the people that they access when they need something because I've become a part of their support system. And before, I never, you know, I wasn't able to, to know the things that I know and to give the help that they need. So just to put it in perspective how much it really helps to have um, workers in the school, in the community, knowing what the struggles of each and every family are and what the students' needs are so that they can come to school and learn, that's a pretty powerful thing. And I'm, I'm really really grateful for the change that we were able to come through KSSN and, and be in the schools and, and help the kids in that um, environment. So at this time, I want to give the mic to Sarah um, so she can talk about community resources that help Jacqueline. So your cups, your little Jacquelines, all have lots of holes in them. <laughs> and um, those holes are keeping her from learning. Uh, from learning to read, as we're talking about today, the literacy. Um, 
and from ke keeping her from getting to school on time. So as a community school, what we try to do is fill up those holes. Um, we get her shoes if she needs shoes. We contact our community partners to get some clothes donated if she needs clothes that fit her correctly. We um, connect her mom to the appropriate um, food pantry so that they can get food in their, in their, on their shelves and Jacqueline won't have to come to school hungry. Our DHS workers have alarm clocks that they can give to the families so that they can make sure they're getting up on time. Um, uh, let's see. <laughs> As an attendance team, um, we're in communication with all of these families um, that aren't in school every day to see what the issues are so that we can get them these resources that we have available to us. And then we're also educating the parents on why it's important for their child to be in school. Hetty Chang talked this morning about how a lot of our families don't value school or they didn't have a good experience in school or they don't understand why it's important to be in school. So we're talking to them about that as well. Um, Elizabeth and I and Sergio and Abby as well do attendance assessments with our families that have a certain amount of absences and are heading towards that chronic absenteeism. And we go into all of those issues. We talk about, you know, what are the needs? What can we do to get your child here? And we educate them as well as why it's important. And even missing two days a month is going to add up to, what, 18 days in a nine-month school year. So that's, your kid's going to be chronically absent if, if you miss two days a month. And that's all it takes. Um, and they'll be getting behind. And that third grade reading level, they're not going to make it if they're missing that much school in kindergarten and first grade. Um, as well as um, intervening and talking to them about how we can help them, what barriers they need removed, we also offer incentives to try to motivate the kids, and as well as the parents, to have their students there every day. Uh, we do monthly perfect attendance uh, rewards. So every month there's a different reward. Um, we do random classroom visits to say, okay, today the attendance team is here. If you're here, you get a prize. Um, tell your friends about it tomorrow, because <laughs> they, if they weren't here, then they didn't get it. Uh, you have to be there every day if you want to be sure to be there for those, for those extra prizes. Um, we've talked about doing some classroom challenges for kindergarten uh, because they don't quite have the attention span of, oh, a whole month has gone by and I've been here every day. But if we can do a weekly challenge, then, you know, they can, we can be challenging them, get here every day for this week. And if your classroom wins, the most kids were here every day, then you can get a pizza party or an ice cream party. Um, we also do a drawing for the parents each month because at the kindergarten and first grade level where it's really crucial, it, they're not getting themselves to school. Uh, it's, it's all in the parents, getting them on the bus or driving them or walking them. Um, so we do a drawing for a gift card for the parents each month to try to get them motivated. Um, now North Godwin, where Elizabeth and I are, has been a community school for three years. And believe me, when we started off, we didn't have all these incentives and interventions uh, to give them. So it's been an evolution for sure. We started off the first year just doing basic interventions. We looked through our list. We didn't have DHS, so we didn't have that extra help. We looked through our list of absences, and the principal and I and maybe the secretary or social worker would just call parents and say, well, what's going on? Are they sick a lot? Uh, do you have transportation issues? What's going on? And what can we do to brainstorm a way to get your kid to school every day? Um, the second year DHS was added and that was a huge help. Um, Elizabeth focuses on the families that have DHS assistance and she does assessments with all of them. She does the same thing we did, it was just expanded. Um, and we also added the incentives that year. The first year we had it, we just did certificates each month for kids that got perfect attendance. And then the second year we started added, adding some basic incentives like um, those little McDonald's coupons you can get for a free kid's meal that we could get from them, straight from McDonald's or Burger King or Wendy's. Um, just whatever we could find, we started adding. The third year, we really expanded our incentive program, and that was thanks to community partners, uh, which Sergio is going to talk about in a little bit. Um, 
and which Hetty Chang talked about a lot this morning as well. And then this year, um, since this whole attendance issue has been getting a lot more attention and press, uh, the city of Wyoming, which is where we're located, has started this, this all day, every day campaign. So we're getting businesses, the library, schools, every, there's billboards on the streets in Wyoming, all with this all day, every day logo and talking about school attendance matters. You need to be there all day, every day. Not late, not taking your student out early. You need to be there all day, every day. I'm going to interject here. One thing that was kind of fun, we did an attendance um, assembly at the beginning of the year, and we talked to the kids about this all day, every day, and they had a little chant go back and forth. So now if we see a student in the hallway, I'll say all day, and they'll say every day. So it's keeping that focus all day, every day, so that they're constantly thinking about it and getting it ingrained into their brain too so that they're then talking to their parents about it as well. No, I have to be at school. We're having a challenge this week. If I'm not there, I'm gonna mess it up for my class or I want this ice cream party. I want this prize at the end of the month. Um, so, and all of those, of course, are dependent on our community partners. So Sergio's gonna talk about that. All day, every day. So uh, as you heard, I'm the community school coordinator at Sibley Elementary. Uh, here we have a couple of pictures of uh, our attendance incentives, uh, the ones you saw. Sorry, my shoulders <laughs> The picture on the left, you can see students getting uh, cups, you know, the fancy cups that are uh, insulated. And you can see, you know, one staring at the other. The pair in the past, in the, the back, notice the parents standing. And then this is a photo. Is it of? Harrison Park. Okay, Harrison Park, and they're giving out bikes and it's related to attendance. There are also attendance incentives. Slide. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about um, our current policies at Sibley Elementary. Sibley has been with a uh, community school for approximately uh, eight and a half years. Um, and, and so we've had some time to, to work on, on, on our policies and our programs and we've learned a lot and we've also made a lot of mistakes and we've learned from those mistakes and we wanna share that uh, that experience with you. I'm going to talk also about how partners um, <coughs> help us to leverage uh, the resources and, and energy and effort and all the support that they give us to uh, to improve attendance and, and get parents engaged in the programs. Um, so I'll start with the community partners. Um, at, at the the heart of, of our incentives and the heart of uh, uh, at the heart of our programs is the incentives that community partners are able to, uh, to provide for us uh, to, to give to parents. Uh, but comparing Sibley Elementary or a community school, uh, which employs the community school model, to just any other school, uh, the difference is that in a community school, there is an organized effort amongst uh, the community partners, whereas in a, just in, in any other school, you know, so and so, uh, you know, Pizza Hut says, I want, uh, we want to bring pizza to your students and, and fill up these coupons and you come to our store and we'll give you these coupons or somebody, you know, a clown comes, I want to partner with you guys half off for your assemblies and, and there's somebody else that wants to do, you know, a sport or a park wants to do a project with you. But it's meet time and, and, and the principal is really busy and that's not really what they need there. They, you know, they want volunteers to help the, to administer the meat board. You know, small groups, so that's where I come in as a community school coordinator. That's one of my roles is to organize <coughs> community partners uh, around a common goal. And this goal is set by the, uh, the principal in the school. So uh, I do this through the community school leadership team. This is one of the components of the community school model. Um, and so the, in these meetings, uh, we have the most invested partners, uh, those partners that have been with us for years and that uh, have a stake in the community or have demonstrated that involvement in the commitment over the, uh, you know, some time. And so what these partners will help us do is, is to meet those needs. So we present to them those needs. So I, I, the principal is there to, to show that he or she supports the community school model and they, you know, that appreciates the partners. And so we present to the partners the need. But we also engage them in coming up with a solution. So by doing that, we, um, we get them engaged and they're gonna own that project. They're gonna say, you know, this is attached to my name 
if this uh, if this fails, it, you know, it kind of reflects a little bit on me. And, and I, you know, it's a personal drive to, to make that program or that solution that they uh, were a part of uh, coming up with uh, succeed. And when the failure happens, if, if it's not successful, or when there's a success, they're going to own that success, and not just that success, but when we present them with the new uh, need in the school the following week or whenever it is, they're also going to say, you know what, I want to also be involved with this. We want to help you. So uh, I know Hetty presented that, and it's, it's getting the, the community to own, own the need, own the issue. Own, in this case, we're dealing with attendance, uh, the attendance issues that we have in the schools. Partners have been a huge uh, um, motivator and, and a huge resource. Their, their support has been invaluable and it's been fueled to, to the, our programs. And, and supporting our attendance program, um, it's helped us to, to create a, a culture really in the school that values attendance with uh, uh, certain programs. And, and when, one thing that I want to share with you is uh, it's, it's a learning um, area for, for growth for us uh, is that you need to think outside of the box when recruiting community partners. Um, there's been a lot of interest as, as the community school model has been has become more popular in the air in the state and, and it's, it's expanding to the east side of the state. Um, some partners or some some schools come to us and say well I'm, we're overwhelmed you're doing all these great things but look at us we're in the middle of nowhere and that we don't have any partners or that it's different, every community is different, and we understand that. I want to share with you a story about Lexi. Uh, that's Lexi right there. Lexi was 10 years old when Mary Ann Prischenko, our, our principal that just retired at Sibley, went to speak at Ada Vista, uh, our, another one of our community partners. Already, that's outside the box. Who would think of another school? Uh, but the, the difference between, you know, Sibley Elementary, I'm sure you're familiar with Ada. It's, you know, they're min, uh, middle class or depending on what you might think of them, maybe upper class, depending on who you know. And so they have been our, our strong partner for a while. And uh, when Marianne went to speak to them about the needs at Sibley, uh, what stuck with her was that there was this girl her age in the same grade, <coughs> fourth grade, who Marianne called the second day of class to see what was going on, why she was in school. And it was because she didn't have shoes. They were torn and it had, they had holes. And so she was embarrassed to go to school like that. And this stuck with Lexi, and she went home, told her mom, Mom, we got to do something. We got to help her. And mom luckily supported her, and uh, they were able to, uh, she got a group started. Uh, the uh, Sunshine Kids, the uh, Happy Sunshine Kids. You know what? I'm probably uh, slaughtering the name, but it was something <laughs> to, that, to that effect. They, their first project was to uh, collect cans, pop cans, uh, and uh, they collected 1,100 cans that they turned into 110 books for Sibley. Uh, the Department of uh, Natural Resources in Michigan uh, heard about it and they gave her an award that included a $100 gift card. And when they asked her, what are you gonna do with this, with this gift card? It was a gift card to Meyer. And she said, well, I'm gonna make back to school bags for Sibley elementary, the kids at Sibley that need it, and their families. And so the partners all said, wow, you know, this 10-year-old girl is doing something that it, it's worthwhile, and maybe they were embarrassed. They're, they wanted to support her, and they did. They matched her, her that gift, and other, you know, so, uh, sponsors of that event also said, you know, I'll, you know, we'll match you too, we'll match you too. And $100 turned into $7,000, and this past August was the second year they've done it. Um, they were able to provide, uh, well, the first year was 300 bags of uh, back to school bags for students, uh, school supplies and things like that. And this year they, they increased it. Uh, actually, they matched it, but uh, they expanded to other schools. So that was a, the start of, of a great resource. And, and this, uh, I like to tell this story because first, it, it, you know, it's, it's a, an example of thinking outside of the box that when, uh, uh, Lexi's mom first contacted me, you know, I was kind of thinking, yeah, sure, we'll do it, Let, it's a great, but I never expected to, to get to this level. And, and the other part is that this 10-year-old, this is like what I like to tell to other people that are just starting, this 10-year-old was able to do what I do on a regular basis, so 10-year-old can do my job. <laughs> so I, I did get with her after, and I, and I got some pointers from her because she, she was able to get some 
uh, support from Kraft and, and Meyer and other stores that we haven't been very successful with. Um, so then I'd like to move into the, the parent engagement part of it, um, parent engagement and accountability part of, of the attendance uh, program. And uh, part of this is public recognition, that, uh, the ways that we address parent uh, this. Uh, we've taken an approach of, of reaching out to parents and not just focusing on students. The public recognition is, you know, comes from the philosophy that kids don't get up and dress themselves and bring themselves to school. It's the parents' achievement. So one of the things that we do is uh, we do also gift cards, uh, monthly gift cards, $25 to Family Fair, and we give, um, um, we give them to the parents. We raffle it out and uh, call the parent to come in to pick it up. We take a picture and say, great, good job. This is you. You, you did this. You, were, uh, you made this happen. And I don't know if you, if you saw in any of the other slides, I think uh, there was a, one of the students holding his, uh, next to his mom. I think it was earlier. Maybe the first one I started was this one right here. I chose this picture because look at how this student, his name is Giovanni, how he's holding his mom. And mom is obviously very happy. She got a gift card. But he looks very proud that he was able to contribute to the home with that gift card. It was like his job. He was very you know, proud. You know, to put yourself in his shoes. Um, going home to tell your mom that because of you, because of something you did, you were able to contribute that to the family. Thank you, Carol. Um, the other part is, uh, the other part in the accountability part of uh, our strategy with parents is linking uh, these resources that we are able to provide through community partners to uh, attendance. So that's uh, uh, one example is our signal for success, uh, which ties attendance to uh, the different resources that we have. Abby will tell you a little bit about it because she's a mastermind of <laughs> Ooh, I like being called the mastermind. Um, so Signals for Success is just uh, a bunch of us um, from our, our weekly attendance team. We're sitting around trying to come up with a way to something new, something different, something parents could you know, really grasp besides just all these numbers that we're talking about, like more than 10 days and more than this. Well, if your parent, if the parent themselves missed 20 or 30 days of school, if they even knew how many they missed as a child, then if they're being told your child's missed eight to 10 days, they're like, that's pretty, that's not that bad. Or, you know, I don't, I don't really see why this is a problem. I think um, what drove this was just that we wanted to have uh, something to, co to connect our community support to the, the incentives that they were providing to our parents. They had come to expect some of the stuff or count on some of the things like our back to school um, like supplies they were talking about, um, counting on a, a turkey basket that they're gonna get at Thanksgiving so they knew they didn't have to budget that into their food, counting on us to you know come up with coats if they couldn't afford coats. All of these resources that we were given all along, they just came to expect it and so we wanted that to be tied into it and we wanted it to be visual not just verbal not just how many days your child is missing so we came up with signals for success which is very simple um, idea of, of using a traffic light to indicate the attendance for your student and where it's at is it at is it green or is your family a well-oiled machine we would say is it yellow do you need to meet your attendance team hello we're here to help you um, is it is it red do we need to try something else instead so basically those lights are linked to whether or not they're going to receive um, a, additional assistance beyond what they're entitled to receive, the incentives that we provide every month for perfect attendance are one aspect and that's a reward, but then the things that they, they've come to enjoy, now they work for them, which creates more of a, a sense of pride, ownership, on creating habits um, that, that last. So um, when they get to yellow, they're notified through their, their child's teacher, through myself, I will, I will send them something indicating you know, that we need to get together and talk. Here's my information. That's where the attendance assessment comes in, where we're going to take a look at the things going on in the family. What resources do you not have that I can provide to you? Or what resources can the school give you? We want to get them when they're at yellow so that they never get to red, so that we don't have to work all the way back to green from red. But there are situations where we've had to do that, and parents are responding to it. It seems like such a simple 
thing that's like, really, that's working? It's really working. People are calling me that I used to have to track down, you know, get out there and find the person or wait for them when I knew they, I think they might come through the school doors and hope that I would get in touch with them because their phone number didn't work. Now I have them calling me like, what's going on with this yellow? Like, I mean, what do I need to do to get my kid on green? And, you know, what can I, and it's like, oh yeah, we can definitely come up with a plan. And it's just like letting them know we're here to support you. How can we empower you? How can we give you the tools so that you can get your child to school every day on time? How can we make it so that your child's ready to learn that they have all of the things they need that give them equal opportunity with the other children in the classroom? So um, this has been really successful um, so far and hopefully this year we'll see more success and um, our, our attendance will reflect that that people are that this is a culture not just a campaign we're not just saying hey this is you know this is what we're doing this year this is no this is a culture and it's everybody's um, issue and it's everybody's responsibility to promote the message of attendance matters from the custodian to um, the secretary to the teacher to myself everybody is a part of the community school model and everybody is responsible for communicating you know that this matters here at our school so um, I'll hand it back to Sergio moving on with other ways in which we involve parents in, in the attendance uh, uh, campaign that we have or just the culture like like Abby mentioned is including them in the celebration. So making them part of, for example, helping us with attendance certificates or, or distributing incentives at the actual event. They're the ones that staff the, the, the incentives. And then uh, educating them as to the importance, their, the importance they as parents, uh, how important they are. They're really the first teacher to their kids. Um, I speak personally uh, because uh, growing up, my parents didn't know what grades I got. In high school, I, I, you know, I could get rid of the report card in, in time or expect whenever it was coming, and my mom never found out. It wasn't until parent-teacher conferences that she learned that I was you know, ditching school or I had you know, a C or whatever, and then my dad really did care. But he, he didn't keep track of what was going on. So that is such an important part, uh, and I think that it's, it's one of the ways that we're... Uh, uh, you know, changing the way we work with parents is, is addressing that issue that the, there isn't the value of attendance uh, uh, or education or they don't see themselves as a big role. Yeah, educating our kids, that's, that's a teacher's role. Why are you calling me? You can't control your class or uh, I'm, I get to feed them, clothe them and get them to school. You, uh, you educate them. So getting them to, to understand their importance as, as educators and being their, their child's first um, educators. And then getting feedback from students is, is one area of growth. It's something that we want to move toward because it's something that we haven't done, at least with students. We haven't um, surveyed students, say, what would you like next for an incentive? Uh, how can we better uh, get you guys motivated? What would you like to see? What's not working? What Things like that. I think it's it's something that we need to, to tweak personally, and I, and I recommend that you do the same as um, um, as you start to implement your own attendance incentives in school. So th this already was a part of our parent engagement, uh, at least one of my roles as a community school coordinator. One of them was parent engagement, the other one was attendance, the other one was engaging community partners, and the other one is meeting needs that families might have that might have turned into barriers. And you can see here that uh, we incorporated uh, the, the Signal for Success uh, program into the community school model. Already, parent, we were providing parents with, uh, for example, parent-teacher conferences. Each parent got a ticket uh, for coming to their parent-teacher conferences for, per child, and they came back, and on their way out, they can you know, check in at this table and get a ticket for, uh, I get, exchange that ticket for a, a hygiene item, which, by the way, community partners did drives at their locations to get. So we had a very successful uh, increase in parent participation and, and parent-teacher conferences, but the, what the Signal for success, success program was able to help us do is separate these. Uh, you can see a little bit of, uh, of the detergent and then the, so over here were the bigger items. So like the more detergents, more expensive, ex exactly. And then as we went women uh, over, then those were the, the, the more inexpensive, maybe the sample size. Or if, if the, the principal said, you know what, no, not this year, I, I see no progress. The people on the red do not get uh, an incentive. So that's how we were able to um, 
Um, this is a good example. It's, it's a good picture because it involves the parents doing the actual thing. I'm not, you don't see me in there or anybody, any other school employee. These are parents staffing the table for other parents. So uh, as you can see, it, the, uh, the community school model and, uh, that we, is what we use to build upon with our attendance program is I think it has to do uh, in great part. Um, our success has to do in great part to that and uh, really getting the community involved, getting them to own it and, and turning the, the school in, in, or the child, uh, well the school community partners turning the school into a child and, and raising or educating our students like a village would take care of a child. Um, is there, if you don't have anything to add, uh, we can take questions at this moment. Absolutely. Um, October 1st of 2012, last year, the governor um, signed into policy that if a student age 6 to 15 was not attending school on a regular basis, and the way we found this out as DHS workers is a form went out at their redetermination or at their application to the school where the child attends, and then the form had to come back, and it would indicate whether the child was enrolled in that school, and if they were attending regularly, attending sometimes, or not attending. Um, and anything less than regularly attending would be our indicator um, that the, the case would need to be shut down for cash assistance for um, not meeting the education requirements set by the governor. If a child was 16, 17, or 18 in school and was not meeting that and we received the form back, then they would actually just be removed from the case and the rest of the family would continue getting cash assistance. Um, that was a message that was given out before it started so people knew it was coming and really over the first couple I would say over the first six months it was more of an education period of letting people know that this is going to happen you know what I mean we're really going to have to do this so that's another like leverage that we had basically with working with some of our families the misconception I think in the public is that it's all benefits are attached to that when really it's just cash assistance and when we first started, a lot of the clients that, that we were working with that didn't have cash thought that it would affect them, but then later came to realize that it didn't. So in some ways, we saw some of that be like, oh, well, it doesn't affect me, where then the people that had cash that really needed it, you know, would do what it took to, you know, get their, stay on cash or make a plan. And I personally have only had to remove cash from one person, um, and they did earn it back because after losing the cash assistance if they want to earn it back. There's a 21-day compliance test, which means that the child in the next 21 calendar days has to be regularly attending, so they can still miss like a day. They have to be regularly attending in order for the school then to give us a new notification indicating they had met the criteria and they could have cash back. is that, um, first of all, like um, Hattie said in her presentation this morning, every district is different. What they consider regularly attending is different across the board. So it's very hard to, um, to, to do it. I mean, and I have students that are, you know, their families, um, Godwin Heights is a school of choice for a lot of families. So we can have students from four different schools. Um, and. Uh, it, it, four different districts, and they all say different things. Um, and like Abby said, the the amount of people that are really on cash assistance that this affect is really small. Um, and then you know also the notifications when that comes through. Um, redetermination is once a year or application. Um, we know because we're in the school, so we know when our family, so we can use that first. Right. Um, our school is 94%. Medicaid for their children at a minimum, up to and including the cash daycare um, food assistance. Yes. Um, Sarah, I have a question for you. Sergio. <laughs> I work at the Grand Rapids Public Schools, and I am at Bethel, a dog registration, with the English as a second language. 
your children, what kind of incentives would I be able to use for adults? What I'll tell you what we've done. Uh, in the past, uh, one of our community partners, it's uh, uh, the Other Way Ministries, some of you might be familiar with, uh, with them. It's they, they are a food pantry. They have other family empowerment programs. What, what they do is they've, uh, they have a program called the, the Christmas Store. And so they sell new toys during Christmas uh, for parents to buy for their kids. But the currency there is community service hours that they do at the school. And we count toward these community service hours, uh, ESL classes, any classes that we might bring in uh, through a partner, let's say it's parenting classes or lead poisoning or lead uh, safe uh, through the Healthy Homes Coalition, lead um, poisoning classes or lead safety. Um, also our PAL meetings, we're actually having a parent meeting tomorrow and they get credit for that. So th that's one of the ways in which we uh, used uh, to incentivize parents. So if there is an event that or, or a benefit that you're able to provide through a community partner, linking that to, uh, to their participation. So getting them uh, in all the time and consistently and get, getting them to do quality versus quantity, being there and actually um, engaging and, and taking part. What I do is, as a coordinator is getting them to, uh, giving them responsibility, not just say, can you come help me cut these up? No, saying you want to be in charge of the mileage club and you call parents. So that's your, that's your responsibility. That's your baby. And then that mom will call. And then that you're giving that person, much like you would a child, uh, a victory, uh, uh, an opportunity for a success that, that is going to improve her self-esteem and her confidence and makes it more likely for them to return. So the, the, the perks and, or benefits are not necessarily you know, giving them something but also the recognition, putting them in the newsletter, the most involved partner, I'm, I'm sorry, parent, and tracking those in a public place, maybe a board, putting their pictures up. It's some of the ways that we've done, um, uh, that we've incentivized parents to, to, to participate. Also, you talked about having partners, partners with your school, community partners. Now, does every school in the district have a community partner? They might, uh, they might. I, I think uh, unofficially, or, or um, I mentioned that. Yes. My role, my role as a community school coordinator, is that is within my job description to recruit. Every community school under KSSN has at least one. So that's what the difference, uh, that, that's the comparison that I made. Another community, another just a school might work with, with a, a partner, um, but they don't actively seek a partner. Or maybe they do, but it's not, you know, they don't have the other components of the community school model. It's not a conscious effort to recruit partners and bring them in. Uh, you know, the, that's not within the uh, system principles. Their buildings, but it's you know funding. You know, okay. there's a whole lot of components uh, that go with it. I but just thought that you're hired and you are placed in a building. That's how I thought. So, yeah. so the the, the community the, the community school model is actually a national you know national movement, and it's in Kent County. Yes, in Kent County, the Kent School Services Network we've applied it to uh, 27 schools. And within the county, and is it seven districts now? Uh, it's increased, and so the community school model is just that, and we apply it. Uh, obviously, every school is different, so uh, every school we apply it in a way that works for us. And part of the community school model is to bring in partner community partners. That's my job to, to bring in partners and maintain those relationships with the partners and improve those relationships, get them involved in the school. Uh, so obviously a school that do, is not a community school just depends on somebody that just might show up. Coca-Cola wants to do a project this year. Uh, they happen to pick Sibley, and, but the next year they're going to pick uh, North Godwin. And then my role is to, is to get uh, Coca-Cola 
employees to come in and deliver the backpacks, meet the kids, ask them for their names, and then somebody from Coca-Cola might say, hey, I, I remember Johnny, I saw that he needed shoes, I'd like to get him shoes. Get them in the school, get them to stay, uh, because those personal interactions are what's going to increase the likelihood. And just because we're part of a network doesn't mean it can't happen at your place. Um, Sarah and I went to Detroit and did a presentation for the Detroit principals, and they had 27 of their 72 schools go up and running as a community school. They didn't have all of the things that the network has. Um, we're very lucky to have um, a model to go on, but you can have, you just have to have the right people who want to do the extra work because it's a lot, it is a lot of work. You know, but it can happen. Um, community schools can happen in each and every school district across our nation. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, we were talking about the cost of living rise. Um, it was very crucial to see DHS work with the uh, neighborhood school board members and the Department of Transition and Community. Sure. Um, I can start. Um, Sarah and I work side by side with one another. Um, as far as the attendance goes, um, she takes care of the families that don't receive um, DHS services as far as completing assessments, hooking them up with community resources, and removing barriers. I complete the assessments of those that have DHS cases. And at our school, there's 20 that do not. So. Um, Sarah is responsible for running the functions at school or getting the um, school functions up and going and things like that, facilitating community schools. The other part of my job when I'm not doing the attendance is I'm issuing welfare programs, um, seeing what families are eligible, what they're eligible for, um, and doing reviews and fun stuff that DHS makes me do. Yeah, we keep it pretty simple. Um, I think Abby provides the, the services that people uh, are entitled to through the uh, government assistance. And then when uh, she runs into a need that is not, uh, she's not able to pro provide through that, then she'll contact me and then I send a, a group email to partners to, to get them, you know, to, to see if they would respond. And we have a pretty good response from partners. Uh, and it's the same way with us. Uh, Abby leads the attendance meetings and makes interventions for those that have cases and, and I for the ones that don't. I recruit uh, partners and bring in the attendance incentives um, to support that and, and create the, the culture that values attendance. No, it's at, um, at high, all the way up to high school, yep. Um, and I was just gonna add that we have um, like other people that are a part of our team too, especially when it comes to attendance. Um, when we have our weekly attendance meetings at our school, we're lucky enough to have a nurse on site um, hired through Grand Rivers Public from Spectrum Health, I believe, correct? And um, as, as well as we have on-site clinicians at both of our sites. Um, we have family support specialists, which are, in other words, truancy um, officers for Grand Rapids Public, as well as the principal will sit on our, on our um, discussions that we have. So it's, uh, everybody has their roles and they've had to be redefined at times. I mean, it wasn't like we came in and knew exactly what we were gonna do. They've changed and evolved throughout the, the years that we've been there. One last question or? We signed as workers, we signed a FERPA agreement um, with the schools when we came on um, site. So that allowed us to share some information. Of course, some of it is still confidential as far as like any knowledge we have of like Child Protective Services stuff because of our relationship with them. That was actually what makes it so easy for me to communicate. Well, yeah, it, so with that, kind of also whenever they sign an application, in the information that they're not reading, they're also saying that they, um, pertinent information um, can be they're exchanged, so they're actually, with all that mess that they're just throwing away, they're we're signing a general application. Yes, in our 11th Well, thank you again, Sarah, Elizabeth, Abby, Sergio, and of course, uh, thank you for the question. The governor, the director of KSFM, um, thank you so much for bringing your expertise to the panel and everybody who attended today. Um, we're on to our next class, 10 minutes, 30. Thank, thank you. you again.
thank you everybody for coming.